Good evening and welcome to tonight's special board meeting for uh, superintendent interviews. This is our second in our series. Tonight we have Mr. Wayne Sharrow with us. So welcome, Michael. Michael. Oh, Michael Shower. I'm sorry. You guys are <laughs> correcting me already. Thank you. Um, what we will do is uh, uh, call over to the meeting and we will do the Pledge of Allegiance, move to roll call, ask for comments from the audience, and then move to the interview. So if you will join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, we will call the roll. Gladly. Uh, President Wasserman? Here. Vice President Baker? Here. Secretary Kaminsky, I'm here. Treasurer Grandstand? Here. Member Gordon? Here. Member McFarland? Here. Member Vanderkellen? Here. Seven out of seven, we're all here. Seven. Thank you very much. Uh, we have no formal requests. Um, anybody in the audience wish to address the board? Seeing none, we'll move into the main reason we are here today. Um, Michael, what uh, we will do is uh, have you give us the presentation you prepared for the board, and after that, we will go person by person with questions, with uh, follow-ups if they're germane to the point that was originally made for clarification. And, uh, and then uh, at the end, if you have a few questions, although I do ah, hate this new phone, um, hopefully we can answer those at dinner. Okay? Um, so, so is yours. Well, first of all, thank you very much again for having me today. Definitely a very fulfilling day, and learned so much about you to the point that I think I want to change my PowerPoint if I can. <laughs> I, I guess I can at this point, and we'll have to wing it going forward. Saw so many good things in your district today. Um, so you know, I started off looking at um, some of the information that you provided to me, the, the profile of what you were looking for in a superintendent, um, and, I, and I worked off there, and it, it seemed to me that you know, you're fighting the battle like so many of us to stay as good as you are or move forward. And so that was kind of my theme off of that. And of course, we all know what the battle really is and it's the financial times, doing good things for students during these tough financial times. And so I'm gonna go get into that and what I can bring into this for you. Just real quickly, some common themes that I picked up and um, it may have my bias on some of these, um, but some themes I thought came out of your superintendent profile that you provided. Um, moving IB and, and should you be moving forward to the primary years program and the middle years program, 21st century learning, what is that, defining it and, and how do we uh, move forward with that piece of it. One to one mobile technology, obviously uh, that was part of your technology plan and, and now you know you take a step back and how do we move back towards the one to one mobile technology piece. Personalization of teaching and learning, there's no doubt that parents are looking for more choice, and, and you know, when they say choice, it's that personalization piece of education that they're wanting. One size doesn't fit all anymore. Early interventions, uh, high quality preschool, I just had a very good conversation with one of your former board members in the room today about early childhood education, how vital that is. You have a growing at risk population you mentioned, uh, and to me that's one of the best interventions, and certainly is one of the best financial interve interventions if you follow the studies on that as well. And we know we need to prepare all students for a post-secondary education. It doesn't have to necessarily be university bound, but a post-secondary secondary education in this world today. Some skills and experiences I think I bring to help you with that. Um, I, I've proven leadership and innovation. I, I've proven that I'm collaborative. And um, some of the things I've done, you'll see that I've been proactive versus reactive. Obviously, in these trying times, we got to overcome the barriers, and again, it, most of those barriers are financial. Um, and so, you know, I have, these are some things that I think, believe I have an innovative, uh, creative record for: innovation and financing. And so, to continue to put resources into this, in the teachers' hands to meet the students' needs, we've got to be innovative in our finances. We got to find ways to deliver instruction more efficiently, deliver our other outside services more efficiently, and use those dollars appropriately. Um, Obviously, talking to your administrators today, they've obviously felt they've done many of these things, so I'm certainly not trying to presume that you haven't, so make sure you take that. But these are some strengths that I bring in there. 
um, cost reductions in non-instructional areas, finding alternative revenue sources, and boy, have you done that with your foundations, what I've heard today, and what a great job that has been, your partnerships in your community. Um, Long-term sustainable planning um, is, is vital when we're creating new programs and how do we sustain that? And I, Carl today talked about your IB and one of the questions I had for him was obviously it, uh, you showed that you had some grant funds to start that program up. Was it sustainable? And he was sharing with me he thought that was sustainable and what the, you were doing with that as well. Um, taking risk. You, you, I, you're going to see that I've taken risk in my career, but they're calculated, data-driven, research-based doesn't always mean we're not going to fail once in a while, but it's well worth taking the risk to try to meet students' needs. Doing what is best for students and supporting staff and their efforts. I think that's a key today. Um, again, I, I'm, I'm going to base most of my decision on what's best for students and how do we provide the resources to our staff to get there. Try to narrow down some examples of things that I have done, um, showed experience in. Obviously, you, you had some bad news a couple weeks ago, and um, you need to take a step back and decide um, where you go from there. Um, I have experience passing bond proposals. I, I passed one in 2007. I passed it by a three to one margin. Um, previously in our district, we had failed two previous bonds prior to my me being superintendent. Um, Algonac schools hadn't traditionally passed bonds. We, do, we use some strategies in there. I'm going to talk about a little later in, let, in a later slide uh, why we were successful. Maybe that would work here. Uh, I have experience managing bond work. We, we finished all our projects on time under budget, had enough un under budget that we were able to go out for a second round of work, and then finished on time under budget and had enough where that is part of our one to one iPad plan today. Um, that we hadn't originally planned to do, and we were able to do that. Creating sustainable finance plans um, long term. If you look at the district I've been in, we've um, been strong financially, and we've tried to sustain that fund balance. Um, obviously, we're now relying on it, like many school districts, but I think that was our purpose all along. It was to have it during these times to get us through. We've developed instructional implementation plans throughout the district. Um, and I'm going to talk later on about our iPad plan because part of it's not just the device, it's the PD and the planning for your teachers as well. Talk about our iPad plan for you and uh, in, in my experience a little more in depth. Um, at this point, all of our teachers have an iPad already. We uh, bought those in February. Um, collaboratively worked with our teaching staff as far as a professional development plan ongoing professional development during the school year now when we have some more going on this summer. Um, it's amazing the growth of the use of, for our teachers. Um, we planned ahead for the Wi-Fi infrastructure. I, I'm sure you guys looked at the same p part of that, but we had to upgrade. We had Wi-Fi throughout all our buildings, but we had to upgrade when you talk about putting 2,000 devices onto that, that network. And we've worked with our uh, technology people in our RESA as well to do that. We've developed a vast set of student policies, insurance, user, and user agreements in order to send these, these devices home. Many of you are concerned about that investment, care of that investment, and repair of those investments. So we've been pretty unique in that. Um, we're self-insuring, uh, and so our parents are paying a small insurance fee. We've, we build that pool. Um, Apple has um, helped us determine the, the breakage, the stolen factor that you would have, and they have some really good data. So and it's one and a half percent and so you would how many devices it's quite low when you look at that piece of it so we've been able to develop all those plans insurance agreements users agreements staff user agreements parent user agreements and we're bringing parents as well as the students in for training as well because in order to send these devices home there's some issues there you have to think about you know we cannot guarantee where they're going to get on that wi-fi and, and where they're going to have the capability to go and so our parents need to be trained as well on how to control those devices i have ib experience we talked about that last time and and i believe there was a little bit of question exactly where was i during that ib experience stage and so i'm gonna go back over that just a little bit for you so when, when i became high school principal in algonac we had we were offering ap u.s history class and a few years later we were up to seven ap courses uh, like you we were rec recognized by u.s news and world report 
um, back in that time for our AP program and the number of students who, who were successful in that program. Um, we, we began to look at how do we, where's the next stage? How do we do some things for our students differently? And we kind of came up with the answer through of IB through the fact that one of the brightest students we ever had was waitlisted at Brown, Yale, some of the Ivy League schools. And when we made some phone calls over there, um, we had a student with 36 ACT, he had all fives on his AP, and how could he be waitlisted? And the, the admissions officer said, well, that's all of our students, Mr. Cheryl. What is the <laughs> separator there? And, we, and she talked to me about some things, and she planted a seed about IB. And so we began to explore IB. We actually, at one point, looked at what you were doing in your district, and, and that was where I was at as high school principal. That when I became superintendent, it was the first thing I asked my high school principal to do. I was superintendent during the two-year implement, implementation and approval process, and, and this will be our second graduating class um, with IB. And as I told you earlier, we'll have nine full IB diploma graduates, and 42% of our, high, our seniors were, took an IB class. So we've talked about the elite kid in Algonac and what IB has done, but it's done so much more, and I'm sure you've found the same. Your teachers now who teach IB now teach their regular classes differently. Um, and so it's bled down, and, and students are challenging themselves. The, the middle student is challenging himself to a higher. It's really transformed our high school, so it's, we know it's one of the best things we did. For a school district like ours, as you know, there's some startup costs to IB. There's some mailing costs, there's some training costs, and the, and the training, much, much of the training, some of it's becoming on online or closer, is quite expensive to send your teachers to. And so a district like ours, we had to get creative. We didn't have as many foundations a, as you. And so we went out and we seeked, um, we saw cell towers as a way to increase revenue. We had a cell tower go on a wooded piece of property that we owned and we received revenue off that. It does not pay for all of it, but it does pay for a large portion of our IB program. We also went out and did seek, seek a gift from one of our board members' family, and they endowed us with some money to provide professional development to our teachers. Like you, for, for a couple of years, we've studied the primary years and middle school years program. As you know, that one's a little more difficult because it's school-wide, involves everyone, every piece of that. And so uh, we are in the stage like you of deciding how do we go forward, where does those dollars come from, can we do it with all kids in our community? I have 21st century learning experience. I can't tell you that I know exactly what that's going to mean in the future. But we we spent significant time studying this. As I told you, the last um, time we interviewed, we had a gentleman from North Carolina who started their virtual school come in, and we spent significant time studying what does 20 cent 21st century look like. Um, we decided to choose a theme of personalization. We we believe that's a driving point going forward. Um, Obviously, you've heard those buzzwords I've put up there from our governor to our state superintendent of any time, anywhere, any pace. Um, I think we've bought into that concept. Um, you know there's increased choice as of March 1st this year. There's going to be online cyber schools that are competing with us, and they're going to provide those our parents those choices that are looking for more, and so we need to also provide that. Like most of us who started with online learning, it was E2020 for credit recovery. It needs to be so much more than that. I mean, it, it, E2020 has worked well for Algonac schools. I'm sure it has for you as well. Um, but there's so much more to those pieces of that. We also did Michigan Virtual University. I see you use several other providers, including your GenNet, for um, those type of choices. Today, we believe um, it's blended learning. So at Algonac High School this year, we had two pilot programs where we had blended learning courses where students spent three days in school, two days outside of school. Um, next year, we have five of those, and we're actually going to provide some of that to other schools in our county. And so there's a potential for some revenue as well as um, filling those courses large enough to run them for us. The blended learning obviously involves flipped classrooms. And you know, you've heard that word, and what does that mean? And it's the reverse role of the teacher being the facilitator during the day and providing much of the other work, busy work, online. And so um, that, that plays into that as well. 
We've used multiple platforms for the blended learning courses. We started really as a Moodle school. We now use Edmodo. If you know anything about Florida Virtual, they have a pretty good um, outline that you can use as well. So some of our teachers use Florida Virtual's outline as well. I also think IB is a big part of first 21st century learning. I know it's been around a long time, but if we want to talk about where our students are going to be in the 21st century, it's going to be a global world. And so, you know, that whole idea of what IB pushes you towards is really going to help them. I also think the whole TOK, the critical thinking, the problem solving piece is going to be huge in the future. Um, we're an information society, and being able to critically think. Um, doing project-based learning is going to be a big piece of it. I see you're, you've been looking at that as well. I thought this was pretty innovative, and then I, I went back to your website really soon, and I see you, or at least are a partner in a, in a middle college, if not more. I'm not sure I fully understand where you are, but this was very innovative for us. It's another piece of meeting our, our students' needs and going into the 21st century as we move students along. For us, it's not our top kids. It's not the IB kids. It's the kids in between uh, that we're targeting. Um, we call it Blue Water Middle College. It's a partnership between St. Clair County, Riso, the local school districts, and the SE4. So you can, the student and the parent has to agree to five years through high school, and they receive both a diploma and associate's degree. Um, it's, it, it's chartered through our RISA, and so they own the student, but they pay as dollars back for the courses that they take. It does cost us um, a little bit of money to do that. Um, but for many of our parents, we're talking about an increasing at-risk group who needs to be able to find a way to do this, there's a, here's a method to be able to get there. We were one of the original districts to begin to speak about year-round calendars in the district. I've had um, one of my local ones pull the trigger and move ahead of me on this piece of it. Um, some of this is financially driven as well, but we, we know that the calendar that we're working in really does not work that well. Um, we also know our at-risk population, summer learning loss is larger for them, um, and so we need to target them. And so it's something we're looking at in Algonac, and um, we believe by 2014 we'll be offering one of our elementaries to parents um, who are interested in the, a year-round calendar. Same 178 or 180 days school year spread out with no more than three weeks off. You would have intercessions in between because parents today, two working families, need those pieces of it. We're excited about the intercessions as well because you know we've narrowed curriculum to meet standards. And so during the, those intercessions, we can provide some of the critical thinking, the problem solving, some of the creative uh, instructional programs that we're not offering right now. So we're kind of excited about that piece as well. Our middle school next year is going to pilot mastery-based classrooms. And so we know the biggest variable in learning for many of our students, we think all students can learn, is time. And so some students learn quickly and should be moved on. Other students need more time. Well, we've done some of that through our summer school programs and after school programs. But the, the mastery-based classroom that we're going to do next year, we will literally move our middle school students through the curriculum, no matter their age, not based on seat, seat time, but mastery. So potentially, one of our sixth grade students can move through the middle school curriculum by the end of seventh grade, and we would be doing high school uh, math curriculum with them. The same would go for us, us learner, a learner who's learning at a slower pace. And so we're very excited about that program as well. First year, next year. Um, former board member and I were just talking about this. I said, do we have this uh, up here? Uh, there's no doubt early, er, early interventions are the best. Um, we're, we expanded our GSRP program um, with these tight dollars. We were creative. We had local districts in our county. Now that it's a countywide program required by the state, we were able to use their slots that were unused. And so we doubled our GSRP program. And um, right now we have uh, 74 of our incoming 140 kindergartners, that's certainly not the size of your district, but we have over half of them in the GSRP program. So how, how do we get to the rest of those students? And so what we've done is years ago, we created an ABC preschool program, daycare. That's an extension of us. Um, the, the curriculum, the style of the program wasn't where we wanted to, so we've modeled that off our GSRP program, and we believe we're going to get some of the same results. We've tracked our GSRP program results for 10 years, and we have that longitudinal data to show that those at-risk students are actually outperforming our regular students at least to third grade. Some of those gains begin to 
even out as we go forward. But there's, there's lots of data, as I'm sure your former board member can tell you, about what early intervention can do. And, and we were talking zero to four prior to the meeting, and, and at one time we used ASAP Pi money to do a, what we called parents as, first te as their first teachers, and we would go into the home and train at-risk parents how to be a teacher to their child. We've lost that funding. It's something we need to get back to, um, but that's another program. What does it mean for all students to be college career ready? Obviously in our state, uh, we are an ACT state at this point in time. Um, we use the ePass Explorer Pan, and we use a decommissioned ACT test. So it's a, you, you may be using the Explorer plan. I don't, there's not many districts doing the third piece. So we give the Explorer in the eighth grade, the plan in the ninth, a decommissioned ACT during their, during their sophomore year. The actual ACT, the state requires a junior year. And now we now give another decommissioned one the senior year because we use that data in our and our student evaluation, or our teacher evaluations for the student growth model as well. That's really changed our high school because we're now being data driven by students, um, actual data. Um, the ACT truly is a college readiness standard. There's some debate if that how accurate that test is for college readiness. If, if you haven't seen that data, um, many of the students who don't do well on ACT still succeed in college. So there's some debate on how relevant that is. Um, we use that student growth data in our teacher evaluations. It's really changed how our teachers look at their data and, and work our, to get our students college ready. Um, we're, we're in our fifth year of tracking our number of students who enter college one year out of high school. So they either start the following fall or before that year is up. We also track their passing rate, their completion data. And um, since we've been implementing this, we've seen significant gains going forward. We have to stay innovative, and it's really hard to stay innovative when you're looking at fiscal restraints. And so um, in order to do that, you have to find some alternative methods and ways to do that. And here's some examples that I'd like to show you that we've done. Um, we created a program called Reward Tutors. So um, the, the stimulus grant money that ran out for all of us a year ago in the federal grant had paid for a significant number of Title I aids for us that pulled students out and worked with at-risk students. And when we began to see that those monies were gone and how we were going to replace that concept, we had a pretty significant group of teachers ready to retire, administrators retire, and we, th we thought, what a better group to, to get a 30-year veteran teacher with all those experiences in their toolbox that they can pull out to work with at-risk students. And so we created a program um, where we pay them a very low dollar, dollar amount. Many would volunteer. You know, when I say low, $9, 10 $11 an hour, and they, they work with these at-risk kids daily. First year of the program, we can, our short-term progress monitoring data has shown huge gains. Our double scores, those things, and we're, this is a very promising program. Uh, and so a, a year or so now down the road, we think we're going to be able to really show some great data on this. Save money, provide the same resource we, we were before versus a highly qualified teacher that costs you significant dollars. I'm real proud of this other program. Um, actually started it when I was high school principal and it's won numerous awards um, recently. Um, most recently the Educational Excellence Award from MASA. Um, also has earned, earned the award of successful practices from the Bill Daggett Group. Um, and it sounds too simple to really have a large effect, but it, but it does. We all know that um, where we lose high school graduates is during the freshman year. If, you, if they're not successful during the freshman year, the, the most never um, make those, ga those gains. So um, we w need to target some interventions in there along with our E2020 credit recovery and our graduation coach idea. And again, it was really how do we mentor students and grab those at-risk students and get someone to own them to help them push through their freshman year. And we, we thought about teachers, but there's cost factors to that piece of it. And then we thought, you know, we really got a highly successful group of seniors who have now figured out how to be successful in, in high school. They know maybe even the mistakes they made when they were, they were younger. Could we train them um, to be mentors to our freshman students? And so we use our senior students. Uh, they mentor twice a week, our at-risk freshmen. And they, they tutor, they, they grow them, they talk about high school organization, and we've increased the freshman um, number of courses uh, that they've passed significantly, and 
our high school graduation rate has gone up significantly. We've also reduced the number of high school students that we send to alternative programs. That was a big one for us. We always had a high graduation or a dropout rate. We didn't have a high graduation rate. We were sending 20, 20, 20 kids out of a class through by the time they got through our system to an alternative high school to get a degree. And if and we all know that those high schools are needed, but this certainly isn't the rigor and the curriculum that they're going to get in the traditional high school. Um, when I was a very young administrator, we had a need to, it was post Columbine, and if you remember, we went into zero tolerance, and we were expelling students for lots of things in, in the reaction to Columbine. And so, despite that, we needed to send students out of our traditional high school, we felt there was, we need to educate them as well. And if you've read some of those uh, bylaws, it's one year, you can do anything for those, some of those students. Then we had the, the court place students that we were looking for. We began to look at an alternative program. Funding was an issue, and so we decided to charter one because if you recall, there was federal charter money available back then. So we got three $150,000 grants, 150,000 three years in a row, um, to start up what's called the Blue Water, well, Blue Water Learning Academy. It's a strict discipline academy. There's now, I believe, 11 of them in the state of Michigan, but we were the very first strict discipline academy in the state of Michigan. And it's still going today, and you know, we're getting all children an education, so we feel really strong about that program. Collective bargaining, I met with some of the union uh, presidents today. Um, a very good conversation. Um, I've been able to negotiate contracts through all of our um, groups with concessions um, and maintain a stable fund balance. And we've done that through really collaboration and, and providing um, information to them up front and working through that process. So I think that's another way to be creative is, is to really work strong with your employee groups in order to find those savings. Make them a partner to find those savings. They even recognized this last fall uh, for our innovation, our collective bargaining agreements. I think after Monday night where we talked about privatization transportation, they would take might take that back. But We've looked at consolidation of services. I know most school districts are required to, but we've been doing this for quite a while. Um, eight, nine years ago, we partnered with St. Clair County to provide payroll and human resources, and we were able to save those dollars and have a larger provider provide us. So it worked extremely well. We pay them a small fee and reduce the amount of cost there as well. That's dollars that we can spend in the classroom instead of providing a peripheral service. Um, we have a neighboring school district. Yes, we're arch rivals, but we can work together when we need to. Need to, and we've we've worked with East China. East China was going to reduce an off business office personnel, and I and I needed to reduce as well. And we both said, well, if we shared this person half and half, how would that work? And so, this partnership has grown. It's it's been just strictly business office related at this point, but both districts have been able to use personnel and save money through that process as well. Like you, we've closed. Um, a couple schools, an island school and a, and a traditional elementary school for us. Um, when we closed one of our schools that were on our high school campus, we still wanted to find a need to use that. Um, we moved Blue Water Learning Academy, which is its own charter academy, into a portion of that where they pay us rent. We created the ABC daycare program, which services all of our um, preschool and daycare students and they they also pay us rent for that building so we found a use for the building and, and been able to find revenue as well like so many school districts we've declined enrollment and, and had reduced staff we looked at our enrollment <coughs> trends way ahead um, we've reduced staff at about a 20 percent rate over the last five years and at this point we've we've only laid <coughs> off three teachers and so we've been able to look ahead and when teachers leave to say Let's find a way to absorb that position instead of <coughs> facing layoffs, which are painful as well as costly as far as the layoff piece of it. So we were able to save funds there as well. Thought I'd throw that quote in, most do, and I think this one really fits when you, you think about <coughs> today and, and you're looking for a leader. And um, I've been asked all day today, what can I provide? You're a fabulous school district and you've done great things. and. Um, uh, you know, what I can provide is is this, I think. It's a way to rally your people and to continue to look into the future and to be the best district that you can be. So thank you very much for having me tonight. Thank you. <coughs> Feel free to sit at the table and sit at the podium here. <laughs>
you catch a breath here before we before we hit you. And last time I think I started to the right, so tonight I will start to the left. Okay. Um, Mike, and I only address you because you told me to do so uh, in that in that way. Uh, I have to come up with some new questions here because your presentation was so <laughs> comprehensive. That's what I was feeling too. Uh, so I, I get thrown under the bus here first. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the initiatives because there were a lot of really impressive initiatives that you outlined there. I, and I really appreciate the collaborative sense that, that you give to us and that I think you will bring with you. Um, but I want to talk specifically about what initiatives that you personally may have spearheaded and can you give us some examples of what those are? Sure. Well, off the slide that I talked about tonight, the reward program was completely an idea that I had. Um, like so many good superintendents, you, you develop the ideas and then you use quality personnel to find it. I went to one of our reti retiring uh, elementary principals, um, a legendary one in our district, and say, I need you to be the person that can go pull all those elementary teachers and get them to, to be willing to do this because obviously she's well respected by that elementary staff. And so I spearheaded it, but she obviously was able to do those pieces for me. That, that's a good example of the program. You know, and truly, IB was my idea, the concept. But I give a lot of credit to my high school principal because I'm sure it was the same here. Idea, concept, implementation, push hard for it to occur, especially when people were saying, I don't think we can do it in a 7800 student high school. Um, but again, he was the one that, you know, organized it, figured out how it was to work with that. Um, I was transition, just had transition from that role, so you know how that may work. In the first few years, we worked closely together, and I was his mentor to help him go through that, that process. I think those were two certainly spearheaded programs that I spearheaded. Can you give us an example of one that you may have done uh, from a financial perspective? Cell phone tower, that, that was another one. I mean, you know, so we began to look at um, um, how do we finance that piece of it, simply driving home, watching a cell phone tower being constructed, and thought, you know, hey, we got a lot of vacant pieces of property. How does that work? Um, went to our recent uh, attorney that's provided to us, and what do you know about cell, cell phone towers and contracts with schools? And she didn't, and so she did some research. Um, we approached uh, um, a cell phone tower company, not a so there's companies that own the towers, and mm -hmm. then they go out and get providers that go on there, and you get funds per provider. And so that was a, a spearheaded um, piece of that as well. Collaboration with our, our unions. I, I've, I've settled contracts before they expired, all with concessions since I've been superintendent. And, and like now, we, our contract does not expire until August. I've, I've approached them. I've provided numbers to them. Um, we're spearheading it, trying to have that contract be done before August. Um, the collaboration. The pro providing the accurate information will drive that through. Okay, thank you. Hey, Hi. Um, you have so many great ideas and things that you've done. Can you talk a little bit about what you do to stay up on what's going on in education and, you know, how you, you know, some of these ideas I'm thinking you might get from other places too and tweak a bit. So what, what networks do you have that you use to stay up to date on all this? I'm going to give a lot of credit to my mentor again. Um, he was one that believed that you need to push yourself in your knowledge all the time, and you need to go um, gain from the best people you can. And so, I, one, I would say I belong to some organizations. I'm ex actually the first place I met School Exec Connect. Well, and it wasn't Dave, but it was someone from his firm, a uh, Midwest Suburban S Superintendents Group that I belong to. And so, we meet together. It's a small group of uh, Midwest superintendents, but there's some very cutting edge ones. Um, I belong to a group that originally the construction company Barton Mallows created. It's called the Educational Insights Group, and they bring um, USC pro pro professors there, Indiana professors there, superintendents, business people who go in and, and it's insight, looking ahead what, what can be done in education. And so you're looking at future trends. And like so many uh, uh, superintendents, you, you, you've really got to be somebody who can read for information and be constantly looking forward. Um, never been able, never been afraid to steal a good idea from somebody. And so you're never going to have an eagle and, and believe that, you know, the, hey, that person can't have a good idea. I, I've heard people that I really didn't think were great educational leaders provide an idea that I said, whoa, if I just tweak that a little bit and change. Um, a good example, 
10 years ago in, in our high school, um, you may remember Adley Stevenson High School at Illinois mm -hmm. was doing PLCs and Rick DeFore's work. Well, 10, 11 years ago, we took a group of uh, six teachers and we went and visited Adley Stevenson. If you know anything about Adley Stevenson, they're, they're bigger than your high schools, two or 3,000 students. And we walked in there and said, our first blush was, we can't do anything like that. And then we came back out and we took that information and we tweaked it and we created something we call seminars where um, twice a week we created time where we um, meet students' needs. So if they're at risk, they're, they're getting that need. But if they're not at risk, we're giving them enrichment things. At the same time, we free up teachers to do the professional learning community piece of it. And so we free up, free up to five or six of them at a time, and we, we set an agenda and allow them to collaborate during that period of time. So I think that's another one. Great, thank you. John. Okay. Yeah, just with, um, with uh, if you're selected as superintendent for MPS, you'd be coming from a smaller district, and there's a lot of similar programs and so forth. But uh, in terms of the, um, the size of the district with a pretty aggressive pace that we need for technology implementation, once we get that piece worked out um, with the budget challenges and so forth, how do you, what would be your approach to coming to a larger district as far as that um, not being as accessible, bigger district, more buildings and schools? Uh, we talked a lot about that today with some of your administrative staff. Um, your union presidents brought that issue as well and said, we've heard that before mm -hmm. from superintendents that they that they plan on doing, um, getting out in the buildings. And, and I said, I you know, recognize that it would have to be done differently than what I do today. Mm -hmm. um, but I, 180 days a year, I eat lunch in one of the school buildings. And so to me, you know, you have to make those kind of things happen. So you get into the school building and you're seen there as well. Um, living in the community is a big piece of it. You got to be out and about in the community. You got to be out in the scene. I, I, you, you will see me at ball games. You will see me at a art contest, music contest. That's what I do. This is my life. This is what I've done. I'm a high school principal by trade. If you know any high school principals, they. <laughs> <laughs> their dinner is usually at the high school and they're covering something, some event that night. So I, I haven't moved out of that realm yet as a superintendent, so I'm going to be out and about in those pieces of it. Um, I need to learn a whole lot about your district deeper about the dynamics of that because they, I have to admit that's probably going to be the biggest growing piece of it is n not just um, to make sure I'm accessible, but the organization of a district this size. You know, I've been in districts of this size are much larger, but as a teacher, so I know how somewhat how they work, but not certainly not from the top yet. So there's there's going to be some growing there. But I, I I saw some wonderful people here today that are going to help me learn that. So we really have some top notch uh, administrators there. So. Very great. Any follow -up? any follow ups? Um, <clears throat> Mike, can you describe the type of private uh, entities, organizations, foundations? Uh, that you call upon to aid you in your existing district, and how would you characterize you work with them to improve Algonac schools? Probably our um, right now the one that pops in my head the most that's really been supportive is, is our we have a county community foundation. I know you have several foundations, what I've heard today, um, but ours is all wrapped in one county uh, community county community foundation. I serve on their grants uh, giving committee. I also serve on a, what they call an educational committee as well mm -hmm. there. Um, and, and I think they really support our local district. I, for example, they have they have implemented 90 iPads into our elementary schools um, recently. They also sponsor what we call um, I draw, draw a blank on the name, but it's uh, food for children that go home on the weekends of at risk homes. So we put it in a backpack and supply that that piece of it as well. Backpack for children at risk homes. Um, but. They've been a great provider of that, and it's and it's certainly the relationship we've built when I'm there, and provided the information about what we're about. They're so impressed with our school district, and so they find ways t to do that. Um, like Dow, one of the big uh, companies in our area is the is Morton Salt Company, and so they've been a great provider, and they've they've continued the food program past the foundation strictly by their employee contributions to, to assist us in one of our at-risk elementary schools. So that, that partnership's big. Local clubs for us, you know, Rotary Clubs and Lion Club, Lions Clubs are a big piece of it. Um, I, I'm a member of the Rotary Club. I certainly go to every Lions function as well. And, and they have a big history in our town, and so you have to recognize 
the players of the town and you have to appreciate what they do and you have to partner with them there's times they want some stuff from the district that we traditionally wouldn't want to they want to borrow equipment or something and we kind of you know don't want to do that they needed their carpet scrub recently and so we didn't they paid for it but we we provided the machine with one of our guys who are qualified to use it to clean their carpet but in return we get thousands of dollars of assistance through the Lions Club as well so I think it's partnerships it's connections it's um, information about how, how, what you're doing in your district that makes them passionate about supporting kids Chamber of Commerce Chamber of Commerce we, we do that um, another good partnership we've used um, the iPads that we're implementing saw some of yours today the, the cover is the better than, than the insurance you can buy them it's all about how good of a protection device you can put on those pieces and so they're expensive right and so um, we were able to go out and partner with one of our local banks we're gonna allow them to put advertisement on that piece but they'll pay for half the cover those kinds of partnerships thank you hmm. any follow-ups Well, Mr. Charo, I think you anticipated most of my questions, and you've answered <laughs> most of them. So I'm glad I pre prepared a few extras. But you talked about being successful at passing and managing bond proposals. And I want to know, what do you do leading up to those? Uh, how do you, I guess the question would be, how do you sell what you know is a really good idea? I, I actually was going to go more in detail on my slides, so I missed that one. You, you, I didn't anticipate that. Um, one of the things uh, I, I noticed today, and I asked the question several, to several of your present uh, um, administrators, you know, what do you think went wrong on that day? Um, many didn't have answers yet. They said too early, we're, we need to analyze that, and I, and I agree with that comment. Um, just in generality and not knowing, and I know our success was based on um, getting, identifying yes voters and getting yes voters to the poll. And looking at, I think you had about a 10, 15 percent turnout. Um, I'm going to guess a lot of your parent, busy parents, particularly your young parents, didn't go vote that day. They're the passionate ones about uh, making sure their children have those things in school. So we, we really worked hard through our elementary buildings, connections to the, to the young parents. I hate to say this, but sometimes high school parents, if it's their last one, they begin to lose focus about the school district. And, mm -hmm. and so you need those as well, um, certainly. Um, but we identified that yes voters, made sure they got to the polls that day prior to our election in there. Um, obviously, sharing the good news of the district and what you're doing good for kids, the fiscal responsibility. Um, we were able to also spend a significant time um, showing our needs of the district. We've been fiscally responsible. We had buses that were aging out. Um, we had a significantly old bus fleet. We had needs for upside, uh, um, new technology. We had used carpet for 25 years in spots in our building when the life was 20. And so we've been fiscally responsible. And it's time to reinvest in Peter's community. Those were some things that we did. OK, thank you. <coughs> Follow-ups? Lynn. All right. Hi, Mike. Um, before I ask you a question, <coughs> I, I will let the listeners know that um, for, the, for uh, the meeting on Monday, I had just arrived in town 20 minutes before I attended the meeting. So I did, was not aware that uh, uh, Dr. Anderson had been asked my questions at the previous meeting with, while I was out of town. So tonight, I had chance for you, Michael, to, uh, to formulate my own questions. So, and like the others have said, you've answered them pretty much <laughs> here. But, and, I, and the first one was regarding your, um, your past mentoring program, which I had just read about on online. And uh, so I won't go go into that. And you covered what my question was about credit recovery with your E2020 and your graduation coach. Um, but I believe last time you were here, you mentioned that uh, you felt that there maybe wasn't enough uh, gifted and talented programs in your elementary buildings. And Midland uh, had some gifted, talented programs years ago, and it changed over the years. But as budget constraints and there was became more focus on differential uh, learning in the classroom, um, it was eliminated several years ago. So my question would be, uh, what would you t do to address the needs in the elementary building where we know we have IB and, and um, a lot of the high school programs that are addressing some of those needs? After six years in the superintendency and a, and a high school principal by trade, I've learned lots about elementary education and how those buildings work. So um, my thoughts in Algonac um, is we do need those gifted talent programs there. Um, do not have the resources at this time to do uh, the personnel side of it. We'll find the resources for the, the little bit of curriculum and 
tools that they would need. Um, so my, my thought is um, parent volunteers who are capable volunteers. Certainly, I believe that we have so many passionate, good young educators that if we work that appropriately, I bet we can get many of them to consider volunteering, um, particularly if there's other needs that they need at some point in time we could work with them on that, that's not costly, providing the personnel to do that. Um, again, I think we, we could partner with people if there are some costs. So you're doing Odyssey on the mine and there's some trip costs and some pieces in that. Um, turning to the right resources outside the, the school to the community um, could be done as well. Um, that is one area that I, I stand by my, my answer last time that I, I wish I had done more and I certainly will be doing more in my district if I'm still there. <coughs> Thank you. Excuse me. Follow ups? We were talking about fiscal responsibility and we have had budget issues for quite a few years now. And so I benchmark with some of the strongest schools in the state to see what they do to make sure they have a very uh, excellent budget. And it is the ASBO Meritorious Budget Award. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? Slightly I am, yes. From, from a superintendent's point of view, not from the school business side of it. Oh, okay. Well, um, it says a well thought out, well communicated budget is vital to develop, developing the support of the school's district stakeholders and promoting transparency and accountability. The Meritorious Budget Award, sponsored by the ASBO International, promotes and recognizes excellence in school budget presentation and enhances school business officials' skills in developing, analyzing, and presenting a school system budget and reviews the accounting practices and reporting procedures. I'm wondering if you will provide the leadership and if you would be willing to work with our auditor who works with Bloomfield Hills for them to receive this prestigious award um, so that our budget will align with um, proper class sizes. Well, I have to tell you, class size is um, another item that, that research, we, we, get, we hear that thrown out a lot, mm -hmm. proper class size. And the definition of that is hard to figure, correct? I mean, obviously, if you have 18 students versus 36, 18 is better. But we also know that 22 versus 25, there's no significant gains or losses in there. So uh, sometimes class size for a superintendent, it needs to be looked at, and certainly needs to be looked at early. My belief is class size and early is important mm -hmm. as we go later on. Um, certainly, I have class sizes larger right now than I would like. I can tell you that as well. Budgeting, I work very closely with my business director, our, our auditors, Plant Moran. I'm very close with them as well. I, I'm aware of that award only in the sense that when I took over as superintendent, um, our outgoing business director had been a part of that process. Um, and so I'm not really sure what all it takes in it, but I certainly would be more willing to explore it, to look at that. You mentioned transparency and you mentioned long-term budget. I think that's the key to healthy fiscal management. So for us, you know, we still sit with a pretty significant fund activity. That didn't happen overnight. That ha that started prior, prior to me, the thought our board gets, there's a lot of credit for having that foresight of always believing they need enough fund balance so when the rainy day came that they could rely on that sum, but not too fast. Um, and our philosophy has been when think school districts go belly up, we certainly want to be in the second half of those that go up and then it needs to be fixed. So I think fiscal responsibility, long-term planning are good. Am I willing to look at that? Absolutely. I think I... Well, and I think part of this class <coughs> size is Bloomfield Hills, they have a class size policy, and it's very reasonable. It's not 18, and it's not 35. This year, my daughter walked into Jefferson 7th grade with 35 kids across the class. So, I mean, there's a balance between there, and I think really want to make sure it's a good policy across the district that works for all the kids in our district. Any follow-up questions? Go to Scott. All right. Um, I don't have any questions, so I'll just make one up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in researching your competition, which I'm sure you've done uh, for this position, uh, can you tell us, in your mind, what are the top three reasons that set you apart and make you the best candidate? That's a good question. <laughs> Fall really quick on your feet there. <laughs> Boy, um, one, and, and I don't know, you're catching me thinking off my feet here. I don't want to 
certainly don't want to talk about competition <laughs> in a bad way. But that, that's a tough question. All humility aside. All humility aside. <laughs> um, Michigan's unique. And I certainly know Michigan and our times and what we can do and what we can't do at this time. Um, I have a proven record that you can look at that I think you like, will like. Um, Scott, you were concerned about my answer. I'm going to take a different way of answering this one. Uh, you were concerned last time about my answer about 10 years. And I think you took it up. You, you read it wrong. So I'm 51 years old. I'll lay that out. You can't ask me that. But I'm 51 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, now you open the door. Because I, <laughs> I have no problem with that. And I, and I use 10 years as a generic kind of time period because obviously I think most of us realize today the day of retiring at, at anywhere in our 50s is gone. And certainly my retirement will be in my 60s and most likely pushing that 65 period. And so I think I can bring long-term um, leadership to your district as well. Um, I, I realize Carl has done a good job, been here six years. I would assume that you know, I'd be here much longer than six years for you. OK, thanks. Okay. Any follow-ups? All right, can you talk a little bit about, um, as a superintendent, when you go to hire new administrators and people that work under you, how do you go about doing that and how do you go about recruiting to make sure that you um, get the right people in the right positions? I love that question. I was sharing, I think, with Carl today, uh, one of your administrators. Um, loss, of, loss of experience is something that's somewhat scary and, and uh, I realize you have some senior <coughs> administrators that at some point will be leaving. Um, I've replaced every single one of my administrators in district in six years and I was sharing the story earlier that um, the assistant superintendent, when I was named superintendent, was my middle school principal who had been in the business for 49 years. And the first thing I did was, can you give me two more years? Um, didn't want to lose this experience. So in replacing them, I've had a lot of experience to replace all my administrators. Um, I believe in mentoring. And so we have to identify young people who are passionate about this, who fit this, and begin to mentor them and getting there and grow them before we ever have the opening. That was what was done with me. This is my first time to ever interview for a superintendent's position. In Algonac, I was groomed and trained to be a high school principal. Took that, and at that time, was groomed to be the superintendent. Um, so I believe in mentoring and growing those people. I, I would try to run an administrative mentoring program with, with any of your interested teachers. And there will be some who don't fit us, and there will be some who does. Um, we may even end up grooming some that leave. That's a good thing to do, um, is to grow people. You, you, and so I think mentoring is a big piece of that. Um, I re early on when I first hired my administrators, I would have to say I felt that there was times I didn't do this process long enough that you're doing. I, I commend you that you will know a lot about me and I will know a lot about you and we'll know if this is going to, is right for us before we're ever done with this process. And so I've actually modeled that in my last two hires where we, where we hired outside the district where we did the whole multiple interviews, site visits, c calling on all of them to make sure we weren't missing some piece in there. But we've had great success um, moving our candidates up with, within, but certainly at times you need to go outside also to get fresh ideas. Thank you. Have, is follow up, have you gone outside often? And what was your success in doing so? Correct, so I've replaced, and I believe it's nine, and, and, I, and I've gone outside twice. So I don't know if that's the perfect balance or, or, or not. We've had great success growing our young people. Very young administrative staff in Algonac and really promising young staff. And the ones you hired from outside, uh, how would you characterize your success with that? We've done very well, and they brought outside experiences, and that's why you want to bring some outside that we did not have. One was a RISA consultant at some point, and so that some of her consulting work that she brought was a tool that she brought back into our district. Are you mentoring your successor? You know, I, I am. I mean, it's ironic because um, I'm sh sure, like after my last interview, um, my, all my board members will, be, will watch what I'm saying and seeing. And we had a lot of fun with some of my comments um, <laughs> <laughs> the last couple of weeks. Um, I, I am mentoring. I've been mentoring two that I believe can be superintendents. Um, I'm not sure either one of them. What we're willing or ready for me to leave at this point in time, and so if it, it's about timing. Both of them are going to be superintendents. It just are are they ready to take it if I if I am successful here? So there's a part of it that has a little bit of um, um, I didn't have that mentor in place ready. Although I believe one of them 
even though he's not sure he could easily step in. There's always a learning curve. Um, the other part about this job, as you know, you've got to be pretty emotionally tough. And so I think sometimes only age can teach you some of those things. And so, um, or experiences, I shouldn't say age, experiences. Um, and so I'm certainly more emotionally tough at 51 than I was at 32. And so I have one administrator that's very capable and that'll be yet to see if, if he's ready for that piece of it. Any more? John. Okay. Um, my question is regarding curriculum and course offerings. Um, when you have the number of programs that you do, can you give an example of where you had many course offerings and in terms of efficiencies or looking for duplications, how have you managed some of the course offerings as your school district has evolved to offer more programs? Our schedule is very unique at the high school level, being our size and the things we do offer. A lot of singletons, so if you've heard that definition from the administrators, cause us some problems. And so uh, we, we end up hand scheduling a lot of kids in because of singletons. We've also talked about, um, we have done our theory of knowledge class, for example, is a zero hour period. Because those kids are often your most involved kids anyway, um, athletically, uh, band programs, art programs. And so how do you allow them to have all the choices they have um, and still participate in IB? And so we had to think outside the box. And so they, we have a traditional six-period day for the schedule, and so we had to do a zero-hour piece of that. Um, we do, and I saw you do the same, where um, you allow teachers to take and do independent study with students. We do the same piece of that. Um, our, we've, used, we've used our online learning also to allow kids to take certain elective courses. So take it outside the day and fit some of those other pieces into the schedule as well. Is that yeah. where you were going with that? Yeah, yeah and just, I'm just curious, were you, were you felt the pressure to have the choices in the offering and to have choice for those programs? Did you ever run into any problem where you weren't able to uh, offer as many choices? How, how do you manage that if you feel the pressure on that? Where you have maybe a few students that want, yeah. you know, there's not a critical mass for a class. Type I'll of go thing. to the Mandarin piece, maybe um, that, that I, I had on the slide there. So that actually came about where we had a student, we had um, contacted Michigan State University, the Confucius Institute there. If you're aware of that, they'll help you find um, Mandarin teachers. So that it's kind of like an exchange thing, and you have to provide housing for them to come. And we were all ready to put the Mandarin Chinese program in. Um, and then we got a little scared by the budget when we got the $470 cut from our governor. And so we kind of backed off of that. And we knew we need still really had people interested in Mandarin Chinese. But was it enough in a district our side that you really could employ a teacher all day, six periods a day? We weren't sure we could get that demand. Mm -hmm. And so um, we used Michigan Virtual University to offer that. That was our first dwell into that uh, virtual world. And so we offered courses that way as well. I certainly would say that um, looking at your high schools, what I saw today, what I've read, um, that we've narrowed our curriculum more than I would like. And you guys have done a nice job of protecting the arts and those programs in the school as well. Even though I do believe our focus still has to be mainly you know, science, reading, social studies, but math, those type of pieces. Our kids need that well-rounded piece of education. I was sharing with um, somebody today that um, when my youngest went off to college and she told me she was going to go to the University of Michigan and be an LSNA major, a liberal arts major, um, dad was so, oh my God, you know, what's liberal arts and what's that going to do for her? And so she's gone on to law school and it's worked well. What I now realize is that broad education, that broad thinking, she's such a critical thinker. She's beyond me at this point. She asked me things that I can't even answer. She has a different way of looking and thinking at things. And so we have to be very careful not to narrow the curriculum too, too narrow and protect those items. But I'm sure there's been times we haven't probably offered your question, mm -hmm. uh, everything we should. But you know, very difficult in a 700 student high school for sure with all the things we're offering. IB, um, so during these financial times, looking at numbers, just worked my high school principal and say, said, you know, how many IB students in these sections can I really run a section with 15, 16? So we've looked at, I think I mentioned last time, will IB allow us to send some of that to other districts? Mm -hmm. So in our county, can I offer I, an IB course to East China School District? Those students take it through the virtual world. We're still haven't got that answer from IB because um, they're, they're 
IB piloted somebody at this point in time is what I've heard. So that's another way of trying to offer what we need, knowing you can't get fill it completely. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Any follow-ups? Mike, you kind of touched on the next question I'm going to ask you, but just a little segue. Last time I used a question that said if I called your board president, what would he say? I did call him today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think he said? <laughs> He would have said that he does not want me to leave. They told me he um, had a flat tire on the way up. I will, I will, uh, that's a mild statement. Okay. Okay. Um, you mentioned in the first interview that you see, recognize uh, that the landscape for delivery of education has to change. You've talked about many things you've done in the past to do that delivery and different items at Algonac. Um, without necessarily defining what you would do or a blanket statement of, of commitment. What do you see as possible changes in delivery? You kind of just touched one. You know, you didn't have an IB class full, so do I use um, uh, online learning to bridge that gap? What other things do you see out there? What's your vision showing you? My vision for education, because I think I don't want to speak too much, because I'm, I'm willing to admit I don't yet know enough or learned enough from all of you and all of your administrative staff in the community about all your needs. But my vision where education is going to go, and, and I made the statement last time, it's going to look completely different than, than what we know of it today. And um, when we tried to define 21st century learning, we spent months with uh, that gentleman facilitating that. You know, we came down to personalization as a theme um, because we have such a variety of learners in the world today. It's not, we all went through a traditional classroom, and those of us who mastered that went on and succeeded well. Those who didn't, were put into the industrial world where there were opportunities for them. That industrial world sh closed down for us. And so um, we, we need to get a lot of them ready for this world, even though there's going to be different paths in, in that um, post-secondary world. And so people are looking for choices and different methods of learning and, and different ways of learning. So it's choice, um, it's flexibility and delivery. Uh, we're going to have students who are we're going to learn it at night. We're going to have students attending school part of the time in a high school outside. Um, certainly the parent component has to grow. We all know that that that's something that parent partnership is something that's hurt <coughs> in our country. So I think those are some of the visions and pieces I think what, where we're heading. Um, Technology is going to change what we're doing significantly. I, I, can't, I can't quite figure out what that means for elementary education, you know, that flexibility and how that's going to change at that young age. But it's obviously it's certainly going to change what we do in the classroom. How does it change in the outside phase? Today I asked one of your pilot district schools, um, were they sending the iPad home? And she said she was. And um, I think it's a great communication tool in the elementary level. So you know how they send the weekly folder home or the information. Our, one of our pilots is now using that iPad and that message goes home on the iPad and it comes back from the parent on the iPad piece of it as well. So, you know, we're using Twitter to communicate with our community. You know, when I, my high school principal first pushed me on, on the Twitter, I thought, well, you know, what is this Twitter world about? But it, you know, we're using it as a great tool to communicate with our parents. Um, we tweeted, um, I think when our, our, we won that award for the PASS program, and so we tweeted it out, and he tweeted it out to 60 people. Within hours, it had gotten to three or 4,000 people that had been retweeted out, out there. What a communication tool, and how is that going to change the delivery instruction as we go down? Information's all out there. there we got online degrees you can get from universities and, and, and pay for them. Um, you, did you just read an article where one of the universities is going to offer a complete online degree for a quarter of the cost of the present education? It's going to change that as well. It's going to change our efficiency, the dollar amount, increase competition. So um, I think all those things we have to look at, continue to measure, look forward, and try to be proactive versus reactive to it. Any follow-ups? Do you have a plan or an idea of what you may see in the future to compete with virtual classrooms or, or uh, charter schools that come in? Yeah, I to think take I, our students away. I think for us right now, and I do, we actually one of the presentations, I thought about at first adapting a presentation we made about what this 21st century learning is. That was the first thing I was going to bring in today. But then I knew I needed to answer some of your questions you had last time, so I tweaked and changed a little bit. Um, 
we do for us right now, and, and we know it's going to change. Make sure you understand. We, we haven't got this thing completely figured out either. But for us, one-to-one, -one mobile, collaboration, personalization, and access. So if we're moving to one-to-one, -to -one, it's the tool, it's the method. Um, personalizing it is, is our, our theory. Um, I, I, I think we have a vision of where we want to go at this piece in time. And that, that was what our presentation tool was. And where are we and what, what are we doing? Master-based classrooms in the middle school, um, increasing blended learning at the high school. What platforms are we using to do that? That's, where, that's the first initial step in where we are. But when you know that the world's going to change. In a year from now, it's going to be different. And, and go forward. But that's our vision where, where we're going now. Continually chase what is 21st century learning. John? We know all students learn differently. And so with the vision and some of the potential, don't know how it's going to shake out in the future. What do you, what would you do in the sense where students are not learning as well through the online learning methods? Um, and how would teachers be used to facilitate using, uh, finding their best way to learn if it's not a lot of these technology related uh, items. I, I looked at your web page and your uh, electronic learning piece of it. You really had a nice piece for you to, is this for you or is this not the whole online piece of that? Mm -hmm. So it, to me, it, um, part of your answer is educating our parents of what that is and what it's not. We have very good students who, parents who will not allow them to take one of our blender online courses because they're not sure the child's ready for that independence yet. Right. Yep. And so we have to educate parents and spend a significant amount of time with like we are trying to do with the tool to make sure parents understand that tool can be good, it could be bad. There, there's other other potential sides of that that parents still have to be involved in. Um, I'm getting lost in your question. It was pretty deep. Yeah, yeah, because I think what you said about the independence piece is that not all students can be independent learners and some are more need to write it down, some need to listen to it, and you know, there's just different ways to reach right. different kids, you know. So, so that's the personalization of the side. That will work for some, it won't work for others. Mm -hmm. um, as we know, some of us who have taken recent coursework and uh, blended learning works for some of us, it doesn't for others. So I'm probably at my age more of a traditional learner, sending the classroom still, um, although the younger ones certainly adapt quicker to that piece of that. Mm -hmm. I find actually, when I took, um, years back what was a blended learning course um, to be actually more rigorous because the, they're, they're measuring you every day and it holds you to a standard as you go on that piece of it. There's a lot of data to show that they actually blended in online learning and I, I'm not totally sure that I believe in all of that data. You know, that data can be improves or certainly maintains the learning that students are doing. So you're right, though. I think it's for some, it's for it's probably not for all at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Kids are more adaptable to it; um, they're learning it. Follow-ups, Yvonne. Well, Mr. Shower, you've talked a lot about uh, some of your very innovative programs for students, but what about staff development programs? Can you talk about some that you've used that were real successful there? Or some that you liked a lot more than others? Well, I'm a, I'll at least give you my theory on where we are with professional development. We don't have enough of it. And so in the ideal world, for me, teachers would probably have a work schedule like you have for me, 260 days with um, some time to period off. Um, because we, we try to do it in 180 days. And we try to do it after school for a couple of hours. We release the kids a little bit early at times. There's different models like that. And certainly we do not get enough, particularly the way education is changing today. So one, we're not doing enough of it. Um, then when I hear from the teacher's side of it, they'll tell you, I'm all for it if it's quality. And so it, when we often do it on every Wednesday after school, the quality piece of it isn't there. And is it relevant to stuff they need? Presently, what's going well for us in the district is obviously, well, Seven years ago, it was the whole smart board craze, and we had the smart boards and had to train our, we were very successful. I took um, one of our lead teachers, and we freed her up a couple periods a day, and got her trained out front, brought her in as our trainer of, of trainers in the district, and they expanded from there. We've been very efficient in how we do those pieces, because it can be costly as well. Um, that, that, that worked extremely well. 
presently the whole iPad is the craze for us and how do we train all those pieces and again um, we a year ago last summer we used our RISA. Our RISA is significantly probably more supportive than what you have here because of you're, you're so much larger than the, than the rest. So I realize that may not be the same resource I have in St. Clair County. Um, but they provided the training of our trainers. Our trainers are now working back in our district as well as our building administrators were trained ahead of time to help with that piece of it. Um, so I think that's one key piece of it. But PD is not done well enough. And teachers will tell you it's not quality enough. And, and so we have to work on all those pieces to improve it. Thank you. <clears throat> Follow up? I do have one. So what did you do in Algonac to make it better? Um, discussion, collaboration, and the other piece is we've gone to our RISA and we've asked them to assist us with professional development and consultants in providing these type of tools. They now ask us what are, what are the tools that we're looking for instead of them saying this is what we have to provide you. So we knew many districts in our, in our area were beginning to look at the iPad craze. We went to them and said, you need, you need to provide us this person who went out. He found somebody, a gentleman named Kit Hard. And if you want to get on Twitter, great guy to Twitter. Because him. It, what he's doing with iPads and training teachers is incredible. And so Kit got out front, has provided that to us. Okay, thank you. Then. My question was about the St. Clair Risa. Um, it sounds like it's very strong, and you mentioned that they helped you with the technology. Exactly how involved were they in doing the technology for Algonac? They are, they're not, they were not involved in, at all through the technology piece. So what they provide for us is they provide our, our network infrastructure support through, through that part of it. Um, they do provide consultant work if we need it. But um, for us, uh, when we passed the bond, um, Barton Mel was our construction manager. They provided a technology person. We, we are fortunate to have a uh, technology director who's extremely well self-taught and self-motivated. And so he was able to do, has been able to do some pretty incredible things um, as far as building the infrastructure to provide what we want. We've struggled at times um, with the, the communication between um, teachers, him understanding what teachers are doing and teachers understanding the issues he has with security and some of those pieces. That, and so we've really increased our collaboration now. He sits in all our administrative meetings. He meets with teachers on that so we can get that communication through. And so when, we, when a year and a half ago they talked about you need to free up Twitter because we want to use Twitter, you know, he can understand why that concept was. And then he went to work on, okay, how do I do that and still provide my network security that I need? Um, when we began to talk iPads and one-to-one -one and sending them home and all of them, the students having access, he, he was like, and so <coughs> a little bit of collaboration about why, how, giving him time to explore that was a big piece for us as well. Re our research is extremely strong. They'll provide us a lot of it, but um, it was it's mostly backbone work that they do with network. Oh, okay. Any other follow-ups to the staff about my question? Lynn. All right, well. Yvonne took my other question, oh, so I'm, sorry. Uh, I'm sitting. I'm I'm going to just ask um, one that kind of came to mind. We've talked about parents and staff and administrators. If we talk to the, your your graduates, your students, what would you say, Mike? Would they would highlight as what made them successful being a graduate of Algonac schools? I mean, I know we have asked our students, and they give us different responses, and they feel very well prepared. So I was just going to say, we do postgraduate survey, mm -hmm. so we, we get a pretty good uh, feel for what they say. We do. A, I think we used to do one, three, and five, but we're doing one th and three at, uh, years out of high school at this point. So traditionally, um, I'll give you a good example. Um, years ago, when I was high school principal, always pushing parents and students to take more math. But if you can recall the years before, uh, four years of math were required. And we, we, many of the kids would not, or the parents wouldn't push them to do that. And then the survey would come back and say, I wish I had taken more math at Algonac High School. Math needs to be more rigorous at Algonac High School. And so at that point, I decided we're going to be the parent. And we went to four years of math before the state ever required it. So I do think that feedback is extremely important to know your strengths and your weaknesses of what your students say. Um, one of the pieces of feedback I can tell you that we've been surveying and getting is our initial IB class went out and the feedback came back and said, I was so afraid of college count, um, but I'm 
the lead student in there. It's really a review of what I had in IB, and I'm sure you've had some of that mm -hmm. same information come back. So we're getting good feedback, but there's always, you know, like, hey, math needs to be more rigorous. For a while, we, um, we had a math series um, that was, back in the MEAT days, very designed to meet the, what MEAT taught. And the feedback from our college students was, this isn't getting it for college. And so we had to tweak our math curriculum again for that piece of it. So gathering that feedback is very good. You always get some in there that, as you know, when you ask for a feedback survey, it's not relevant or whatever. <laughs> but it, it, it's very good information. Thank you. Any follow-ups? I have one. Conversely to Lynn's question, have you gotten any feedback, or what type of feedback, if any, have you gotten from people who are graduates or even non-graduates who are unsuccessful? Yeah, that, that debt is obviously in there. I don't know if I can pull exactly some pieces off of that. Um, I'm not sure I can off the top of my head, but obviously we do get feedback of students who weren't successful and, and you know, why. And it usually is, you know, was the rigor there? Did, did they, were they properly prepared? Um, were they disciplined enough, ready? to do those pieces of that. That's kind of what's coming to off the top of my head off that question. Okay. okay. Yes, Kim? Uh, is your, pro your international baccalaureate program based on project-based learning? You know, I, I listened to you guys talk about project-based learning, so I would say no, and I don't know exactly the, where you've looked at it, so no. Um, and, and, then it, and then I've looked at, um, I had some experience with project-based learning and being exposed to it through that Midwest Soup group. There's um, Zion Academy out of Illinois is a uh, project-based learning new tech high school. I assume that's what, where you've been kind of looking at those type of pieces. So I'm very aware of it, and I like it. Um, my middle daughters, who's an educator, actually interviewed at that school, and, and so I know some of what they were, you know, were trying to accomplish. Um, the, the principal of that building comes to our conferences, and we hear about it. Um, but that's my biggest exposure to it. I can't say we emphasize that through the IB piece of it. Follow-ups? Yeah. Well, I also wanted to ask about the MYP and PYP, and how long have you been studying it, and what's holding you back now? Yeah, we, we sent um, our, a couple principals to go out and um, at, at different conferences take a look, uh, review that. I really think that if we're going to do this, we need to put a systematic plan together, make sure the entire community understands where you're going because this one isn't a choice. You know, the, the high school you choose to be in or you choose not to be, these are school-wide and affects all and the entire parents, the high and the low as well. And so to me, you would have to have a well-planned out plan how you're going to introduce it. You may have buy-in before you do it. And so uh, I, I would say we may be moving that way. Our board wants to go that way. So. Well, they have special needs, best practices, training, and their training is covered under Title II. Have you been paying for your training through? Yeah, no. Um, our, our title dollars are used in so many other areas we need. We, we would not max out. Like that, yeah. Follow ups? A little bit onto that on the PY, on the PYP MFA. What were the learnings you got from your high school implementation that would make you do, I know it's not the same, so don't, right. don't miss, that would you, cause you pause in how you would do it different um, at a PYP or an MYP? I, w I would say certainly when we, we began to do our high school, um, we do an IB in the night at our middle school, and we do that every spring. We do it for all grade levels. We're trying to expose them early what IB is and what it's not. Um, the rigor had to be there uh, to build the, the uh, IB for the high school. And so we had the AP courses, but did we have honor courses and advanced courses in the middle school to prepare those students to be successful before that? So we got, we had some questions from parents who were, um, yes, my students are uh, college bound. Is IB right for me, and is my child ready for that rigor? And the answer is, you know, in the IB diploma program, is depends, mm -hmm. and you have to ask yourself. And they may have to not play three athletic programs and, do, and to be in IB and then do it, the complete program, do it well. So we were very honest with all of them through that process. process. <coughs> and so when I when we do look at the PYP and the MYP, and it's school wide, and it does have methods to meet all of them, but I think 
now you got to educate all parents why or else you were you would be pushing resistance so again I think it's the plan on how we educate the parents and, and I shouldn't leave out the teachers because certainly we work had to work real hard to encourage some of those teachers to step up and teach those IB courses it was it's certainly more rigorous and more work many who get in it would never trade it for anything as you know they have wonderful students and um, the great challenges of what they see but um so now you're asking teachers to buy into the concept. And much of it's a school-wide concept of, of what, what is what you're selling in those programs. And so we would need, certainly need the teachers on board as well. Yeah. Any others? Back to you, Scott. Are we going through another round? Uh, we'll go partial. we got 10 minutes. We might okay. use the 10. Last time we had like Sounds good. three or four. I asked Dr. Anderson the same question. Uh, if you have seen the tape, you know what it is. Actually, I haven't. It, did, it wasn't out yesterday. So I <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. We didn't put it on the internet. On I, I <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any significant unfinished business in Algonac? And if we offer you this position, tell us a little bit what you think your legacy will be that you leave behind. Yeah, there certainly is unfinished business in Algonac. I do feel that. Um, coming here and doing this. Um, wasn't my original plan. I wasn't looking for a job. It, it came available and I began to go forward. Uh, any, any school district changes superintendent right now is facing some tough times. But I believe we're still at least a year or two before revenue is going to come. 2014 election may play into that. But certainly revenue is increasing and, and they're going to feel the pressure, um, certainly by next fiscal year, to send that out to us. Um, obviously, it still may be tied to some things. Um, so that, there's that big piece of it, you know, did I, am I, if I finish things in Algonac well enough for the next one to be successful, have I got us financially where we have, I kind of think I have done that. Um, we've been talking about the whole privatization issue and so maybe it's good that I'm the one who's catching the brunt of, of that piece of it versus a new one having to walk into that piece of it if we do or do not do that and we have not decided that yet uh, completely. Um, th there's lots of fun fish. You talked about did I mentor the, my candidate and it, is he ready if I leave you know I had you, you felt that I had some doubts if, if he was fully ready for that so yeah there's unfinished business there my legacy there um, IB the bond program putting technology in um, working through that um, my community knows I'm passionate about getting community schools that's who I am I, I went to school there I walked through those halls I'll come here and I'll be a, a, a chemic and all that, but I certainly was born and bred a, a muskrat, and so that, that, that's going to be really hard to, to walk away from as well. Thank you. Yeah. I think we can do another one. All right. Will you be a charger, too? Yeah, I'll, I'll struggle with the second <laughs> name. Really no, I, I just wanted to put it out there. Yes. <laughs> um, can you give us some idea of what you do on a daily basis, weekly basis, to stay up to date on what's going on and what's changing in education um, through the state government and also the national government? Yeah, we, as superintendents, we have to be involved in the process. We can't just sit back and say Lansing, Washington, and Detroit is fair. Um, to me, education is going to change, and we can't let legislators decide that without us being at the table. The whole skunk works issue, right? We need to be at the table with that. Um, and we need, we need to stop being our own worst enemy in, in the sense that we throw blockers up and aren't willing to look at what they're wanting to look at as well. And so it's all part of the conversation. And, and I actually believe um, our state superintendent's done a great job of that conversation because there's times where superintendents are probably quite mad at Mike Flanagan at times because he's, he's willing to be at the table and talk about doing things differently. But he's also saying we need to be at the table. I, um, I had a fortunate um, having two of our representatives. One was somebody I grew up with in family name in our community. I mean, I literally would, we would literally stop at times and see him on Saturday and Sunday at his house and walk around his house and have discussions about what, what's going on in Lansing and our intake on that piece. I've testified in Lansing uh, a couple of times at his invite. Um, I somewhat hate to admit this, but Phil Pavlaw is, is one of our representatives, and I know Phil quite well. If you know, he's, this, he's heads the education committee, and he's not real popular at this point with most school people. But so I can... I probably could call Phil right now or I send him a text message and he would respond. So those relationships are important to have. I serve on um, our region's MASA, oh, excuse me, I, as a region representative, I serve on the MASA Legislative Committee. So I am in Lansing once a, once a month as well. Um, and certainly we're communicating as much as we can with Washington. 
and Midwest superintendent groups tries to invite a Washington representative there as well. We have to be involved. I'm not, I'm not a big believer. I wish there was no lobbyists, but since there is, we certainly have to be involved and have lobbyists be pursuing our issues as well. Thank you. Follow up? See none. We're pretty close. Do you have one more? I do have one. Okay, more. John, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just looking at, uh, at your CV, looking at, at uh, under education, um, you have the Bachelor of Science, Master of Arts, but I'm not familiar with education specialist degree. Can you tell me what, did you have any uh, areas that you emphasize in particular with that? And I know that I'm familiar with like a PhD level, but that's kind of new to me. Yeah, for schools, um, education specialist is common. And so it, it is the first, um, and please don't hold me exactly, it's 38 hours of what a doctoral program would be. Okay. And, it, and it is emphasis is in central office administration and superintendency. That is my emphasis on that. So my master's was um, educational administration, the principalship emphasis. My master's specialist is in central office, the superintendency. So uh, I, I have proper endorsements, and, and if, even though um, my teacher for superintendent is still um, at choice, I have the full endorsements for that because it qualified me for all of those pieces for, as well for the state of Michigan. So I have the certificate for that. Um, went through the whole Michigan Leadership Institute many, many years ago. Um, uh, and so, you know, if you know anything about that, he, that's a not a degree, but certainly a training to be a superintendent as well that you go through if you're looking at to be a superintendent. So I've superintendent speaks long time, I've been trained for a long time and I have the full endorsement. And that's what a educational specialist is. That's pretty common. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well the clock I will stop the questions at that point unless somebody has an absolute need to ask something and give you a few minutes to tell us why you want to be a superintendent after what you've seen today and, yeah. and learned over the last few weeks? Well, again, I, I'm very, very impressed with the Midland schools. And so I, I, I went, wrote up there, good to great. And boy, I'm starting to wonder if you're not already near great. And I, but I know you're, what, what your emphasis is. And you certainly want to be great. And you want to be one of the leaders. And if you're standing still, you're being passed. And so you need to continue to move forward. And so um, that's what I hope to bring to you, be here. Um, very impressed with with the, the students in the schools today, uh, what was going on out there. Certainly trying times in education, but like I told you before, exciting times in a lot of ways if we can focus on the positive side. If I told you union reps that today, I said I know we've been kicked pretty hard at times in, in education and it's tough to take, but I refuse to focus on that negative side of it and I want to focus on the positive, what we're doing for children and looking forward. You, you guys have been very progressive in doing those things. So you've done great things for kids out there. And I think your, your questions and your challenges as you go forward is more is how do we continue to do great things for students and be a, be a leader. So hopefully that was my message there today. It certainly wasn't that I was presuming I, you, know, you weren't greater already. So I'm very excited about the challenge. Okay. With that, thank you very much. Um, officially, we are recessed to go to the H Hotel. We're in the same room for dinner. It is still part of an open meeting. Um, and we will reassemble at, uh, I think it's 7 p.m. if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yep. We will see you there. Thank you. <laughs>